be faithful to complete it. He'll be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful. If the struggle you face is slowly replacing your hope with despair, or the process is long and you're losing your soul in the night, you can be sure that the Lord has his hand on you, safe and secure. He will never abandon you. Are his treasure, he finds his pleasure in you. He who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you. awesome. It's right out of Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's his to complete, not ours. Isn't that good news? Um, have you ever placed confidence in yourself and seen how that works out? It's much better to place confidence in him. I, um, I watched a uh, Josh Hamilton yesterday, some of you might have seen that, they were, uh, they were installing him into the Hall of Fame, the Texas Rangers were, and uh, how many of you don't know who Josh Hamilton is? Okay. All right, Hambone was a ball player that played for the Texas Rangers, and he's, uh, he's most famous for hitting a whole bunch of home runs at the Home Run Derby, uh, but he's also famous for hitting four home runs in one game. Uh, the guy was incredibly talented, maybe the most talented ball player ever to step on the field. But he got mixed up in drugs and alcohol. And so when he started his career, uh, he was all messed up on drugs and alcohol. And, and when he got to be about 30 years old, he finally got himself straightened out enough he could play. And truthfully, it was a bit unfair because they really just kind of stood him up and got him out there enough to play because he was so incredibly talented. He was fast. He could throw the ball. He could hit. How many of you know what it means to be a five-tooled player? If you don't, get with me later. I'll tell you what that means. That's a big deal. Uh, and certainly he had his demons. And, uh, and yet he found Jesus as his personal Savior. And when he did, it changed his life and sent it in another direction. Now, Throughout his career, he would fail. He would fall back into his addiction. And each time, he would come back in complete repentance. So I thought it was interesting that they're putting him in the Hall of Fame. And uh, Josh Hamilton talked about the only thing he knew to talk about. I, I think you ought to Google it at some point. Because he wrote out a whole testimony about who Jesus is. And not about how competent he is or how confident he is in himself but how confident he is in God. It was a 
it's clumsy. He's not a speaker. Uh, it's, uh, it's disjointed. But it's his story. And, and I was reminded again, you know, when you, when you have a personal testimony, when you know Jesus as your personal Savior, and you're putting your confidence in that, you have a testimony. And, you know, people can argue with all kinds of things. You can argue theology all the time. People love to do that. But you can't argue with a changed life. And, uh, and he seems to be a man at much greater peace but I just thought it was interesting that you have 30,000 people packed in there, and Josh didn't talk about baseball, he didn't talk about Josh, he talked about Jesus. And, uh, and he got cheered for it. And in a sense, he's turned out to be this incredibly genuine Christian. And I think, uh, and, and I think to the delight of many of us, because it shows that certainly we're not perfect, we're just saved. Which is why I never put a Christian bumper sticker on my car. You know, because of the way I drive. <laughs> you know, I've seen those on cars. Christians aren't perfect, they're just saved. You know, and, and uh, matter of fact, I got into, uh, 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 Michael, appreciate this. I was, I was headed to Sarasota from Tampa. Now, when you, when you get on that road, everybody's from Detroit and they're pulling an Airstream. And, uh, and, and all that happens is the road keeps going down to one lane and back and down and back. And so you want to get around those airstreams so you don't get stuck behind them. And, and then I was, I, I was headed toward a bridge, and there's a, there's a bridge over there that, that goes down to one lane going both ways. And, uh, and I'm in one lane, and this other guy's in another lane. He's in a Cadillac, which makes me mad already. He's got a way better car than me. And so I'm going to beat him to the bridge. And we're playing chicken for that one lane. And, uh, and, and we're next to each other. And we know what's going on because we're yakking at each other as we're, you know. I mean, I'm standing on, I actually had a matador. Remember what a matador was? Most awful car in all of creation. Uh, it, was, it, it was sort of all the four car makers put parts out and they put it in one car. <laughs> And it took all the bad parts from Ford, all the bad parts from Chevy, all the bad parts, you know, from Pontiac, throw them all together in one car. And, uh, and I mean, we were coming down to it. We weren't from here to the window. And I finally hit my brakes and kind of, car did kind of this, and he barely got in front of me. And as soon as he did, there was a bumper sticker on there that said, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And I realized I had to forgive him and me, and it reminded me, never put one of those on your car. But uh, it, was, it was good to see, and, uh, and I appreciate what he did. We're starting in on the names of Jesus, the wonderful, wonderful, majestic names of Jesus. And this morning I'm going to talk about He is Lord. Uh, matter of fact, the most uh, majestic name that you can give to the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord. Because Lord means absolute, full, and complete authority. Kyrios. It means you are Lord. It's a big deal. And, and names are a big deal. You know, when you, when you get, ready to, get ready to name your child, you just don't randomly think about it at the last minute and name your child, right? At the names of some children I've seen, I think some parents actually did that. Uh, just a hint, don't ever make up a name. You know, where you take three or four names and try to fuse them together, and so your child, its entire life, has to spell its name, or the teacher can't pronounce its name, and and people give give kids all kinds of different names. I went to school with three girls, and their names were uh, Love, or Faith, Hope, and Love. That was their names. Their dad was a pastor, and so they named their kids Faith, Hope, and Love. And I always kept thinking, what's going to happen when they have another child? You know, what kind of biblical name is that child going to get? You know, uh, if they have a little boy, will they name him circumcision? I mean, you know, what are they going to do when they get another child? As you think about it, you think about the importance of a name. And I was thinking about names and important names that I, that I know people have named their children. And I thought about little Kelly. We've been praying for Kelly, uh, my little... Uh, counselor 
who had uh, quadruplets, four, little tiny little thing, just skinny, skinny, uh, little bitty thing. You saw her, she, she, did the, she was the little dancer in a couple of our programs, and, and God bless them, uh, her and Lance, with four babies. And they gave them such interesting names. Uh, one of them's name is Tinsley, one is Addison, one is uh, 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 Emery, and one is Michaela. It spells out team. And that was their idea, to spell out team with these four little girls. But they're micro preemies. She made it 25 weeks. And of course now the babies are uh, been, in, been in the hospital since they were born. Um, and they're, they're still there, and they're doing fine. Addison had heart surgery this week, and it went, went quite well. And the babies are up to about five pounds. So sometime in September, those little babies are going to come home. But they're still Tinsley, Addison, Emery, and Michaela is in heaven. And it's interesting to hear them talk as parents, because... They're going to use the names in those children's lives to, uh, to encourage them their whole lives. They're never going to be without Michaela. Matter of fact, she's the one that anchors it, that M. And she's always going to be a part of their life. And they're going to make that a part of, of their history. And I think, how appropriate. How important are names? You think about your own name. And uh, most of us growing up, you know, we didn't like to hear our names. <laughs> I remember uh, uh, I was in, I guess it was about the fourth grade, and, and me and my buddy Lee got in trouble on the first day. And, of course, you know, the teacher asked me my name. You know, she didn't know me, and I, so I had to tell her my, my name, and I said, it's Steve. She said, Steve what? And I said, Smith. And she said, I got it. She turned to my buddy. She said, in your name. He said, Lee. And she said, Lee what? And he said, Guess, because that was his last name. And she said, don't get smart with me, young man. You're already in trouble. What's your last name? He said, guess. She said, I'm not going to guess. Tell me your last name. And, and she's yelling at him, and he keeps saying guess, and she gets madder and madder, turns to me, and she said, what's his last name? And I said, guess. Man, she had us down to the office. It was awful. So your names can foul you up from time to time. Uh, you know, your name can be stolen, and that's a bad thing. But names are important. They're very important. And you live up to a name. I'm named after my uncle, so my middle name is Gene, my Uncle Gene. And that's, that makes me super proud. I got a nephew whose middle name is Stephen, and that makes me more proud. And so you, your, your name is an important deal. And names are important to God. Like even in creation, as creation started, uh, you know, God begins to create and he creates light and he calls the light day. First name ever given. Think about that. The first name ever given to anything was given by God in creation and it was the name day. The second name given was the, the, the name night because he, he divided the light from the dark, and he called the light day, and he called the dark night. And then the heavens, he separated, he separated the lands from the heavens, and he named the heaven, heaven. It's a name that God gave it. We can just, we can just make that up. And then he divided the earth, and he, he, he called the ground that we walk around on earth. And then, of course, he divided all the sea, and he calls the sea, the ocean, the sea. And he's giving names as he goes. And then, of course, when, when we get to chapter 2, he creates man. He creates man out of the dust of the ground. I love that in creation when, you know, he just sort of just the sweep of his, his hand, he's making all these different things in creation, and then he gets to man, and he takes dirt. Uh, you know, there was a scientist who, who was a cloner, and, uh, and he, he kept saying, uh, that's no big deal. You know, we can take organic material and, and we can clone anything now. And so he's in an argument with God. And God said, well, okay, he, let's see you do it. And, uh, and so the man goes down and he reaches down and he grabs some dirt. And God said, no, you got to get your own dirt. 
So, so God takes the dust of the ground, is what it says. Just a little bit of dust. And he creates man. He creates man in his own image. There's a, there's a marital tip here. Uh, man was made of dirt. So in Adam we have the first dirty old man. Okay? And because we were made of dirt, we never fully recovered. All right? You, you ladies know that. There's just stuff I do that Donna just looks at me and goes, what? You didn't, what? You know, there's just things we do. We do dirty things. We just can't help it. We were made of dirt. Uh, here's something a woman never does. Oh, I can wear that again. Hang it back up. <laughs> Women don't do that. Women don't jump in the pool and think they took a bath. That's a man thing. I, I, don't, I don't think my boys took baths for, you know, five or ten years. They'd jump in the pool, come back out, get dressed. They're ready to go. Thank God we had the pool. Uh, but, but he made man, and then he gave man an assignment. His first assignment was to farm. Do you realize that, that the first job was to farm? He put him over all of creation, and so he was to tend to everything. Now, it wasn't work. It was joy, and that was Adam's first assignment. His second assignment was to name some things, and he was to name every living creature, every animal. You know, people criticize this, and they say, how in the world could Adam name every creature? When you look around and you see the birds of the air and the beast of the field and you see everything that's out there and you think, how in, in, in the world could, could the mind do that? You have to remember this is a totally regenerated mind. This is a mind with absolutely no sin. Created by God. Created in God's image. And when that mind is that clear, that's part of what heaven is. The clarity of mind, the, just the imagination that Adam must have had to be able to name every animal. Think about it. I mean, he's looking, I don't know, it's little ant. So that thing comes along with a kind of funny nose. Ooh, anteater. And, uh, and he's naming everything, and he just keeps naming them and naming them. They just keep coming and coming and coming. And I can see him getting exhausted and just going, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it looks like a donkey. It's got stripes on it. Uh, you know, and he calls that a zebra. And, and then he, he realizes, and what God was doing is God was, had his marketing plan working because he was going to show man that there wasn't one for him. The whole thing was set up. So that he would fall into a deep sleep that God would excise one of his ribs and he would fashion a woman. So man made out of dirt. A woman made out of the organic piece of man. Yeah, people have also criticized how could, how could God anesthetize, anesthetize him to the point where he could take a rib? Hmm. No, you put a man in a recliner, <laughs> give him a remote control, put a little golf on. You can take a rib. You can take a lung. You can probably take his heart. You can take it as long as you don't take the remote. He's not coming around. And, and so God put him to sleep, and when he woke up, he named the woman, woman. And woman is a word for, uh, which really means soft man. Uh, and, and so in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 23, it says, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. And then when he sees Eve for the first time, he says, at last, the man explained, this, is, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. That is all Hebrew for, wow, God, way to go. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a hippo. This is awesome. <laughs> he was so excited to see man soft, to see woman, and he named it. And he, he had that he had that name given to him by God through his heart. And so we have, uh, we have over the years tried to redefine all that. 
but it, it is it has been given all the defini definition it needs there in Genesis. Any, anything we do to redefine the difference between man and woman is futile. So let me give you the significance of, of names, just kind of facts, just some things as you think about how does God think about names. First of all, God places great value on a name, serious meaning in a name. When you, when you name your child, it means something else. The second thing that God thinks in terms of names is that names convey roles of importance. You think about uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the name was given Isaac. And Isaac, you know what Isaac means? It means laughter. And Sarah laughed when Abraham came in and he said, God told me that we're going we're gonna to bore a son. And here's, here's Sarah 90-something and Abraham 100-something. And she laughed. She laughed. She laughed about the whole thing. And so when they had the child, they went ahead and named him Laughter. So it was a reminder what God had done. Isaac's name was, was Laughter. Jacob was, it meant, you know, somebody who was a swindler, a taker of things. And for years he had that tendency and he had that sin in his life. And then one day he wrestles with God and he ends up, God changing his name to Israel. Because he becomes the nation of Israel. Moshe was the name that was given to Moses. And, and that name actually means pulled out. You think about the, 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 way, that, the way that Moses came to the Pharaoh's home. He was, he was drawn out of, is the technical name, Moses. Drawn out of a basket. And then... Uh, the, the basis for the name Solomon is Shalom. Shalom, which means peace. And here's David, a man of war. And he has a child, and his heart's desire was to have a child who was a person of peace. And so he gives him the name, Peace. Solomon. That's what it means. So names sometimes help us understand that. And then, then names are added for emphasis. Your names, names get, uh, get added throughout Scripture for emphasis, like John the Baptizer, Judas the Traitor, Simon the Zealot, Peter the Rock. Saul would become Paul. And so all of these things are significant to God, the, that the, he places such great value on the name, and, and uh, it conveys a role uh, of importance, and, and, uh, and that's the way it was. And when, when we begin to think about the, the names of Jesus, we think, first of all, of Isaiah 7.14. It, uh, it says, All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son. And he and he will call and and uh, he, and a son and will be called him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if you drop down then to Isaiah nine and look at verses six and seven, it says, "For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government shall rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with the, with the fairness and the justice from the throne of, of his ancestor David for all eternity. It's exactly what the psalm that, uh, that Noah read is about. And the, and the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. You see... Isaiah is making a prediction, and this is a prophecy that happens 800 years prior to it happening. And we see it happen when you, you know when you go to Luke one, you see the prop, uh, the uh, the uh, prophetic word fulfilled in in chapter one, verse 26 through 28. It's fulfilled. He comes to a virgin, and he finds a virgin. And the angel makes this pronouncement right out of Isaiah to the virgin. Just imagine being a, being a small girl about 15 years old. 
And, and you know the history, you know Isaiah, and you know what the nation is waiting for. They're waiting for Messiah to come, and, and they're expecting him any day, just as we wait for him to come, any day, at any time. And as, he, as they're waiting, they understand this prophecy, and this 15-year-old girl is spoken to by the Spirit of God through an angel, that she is conceived in her womb. She's never known a man. And will not know a man. And, and yet God placed in her womb, the Holy Spirit places in her womb, Emmanuel, God with us. And then he makes the announcement to Joseph. <laughs> Joseph needed some angelic leadership himself. Can you imagine? I mean, I feel, I feel for Joseph. Joseph. He loves Mary. He's betrothed to Mary. He's excited about Mary. Can't wait to marry Mary. And then when you were betrothed, it was like you were married. And then he, he gets the angel in a dream, and the angel explains the whole thing to him. And, of course, he's obedient, completely obedient to the leadership of God. That's an amazing thing. That's an amazing thing. By the way, Scripture tells us, that, uh, that they had no sexual relationships at all till after the birth of Jesus. Because Mary was to be a virgin. And so he steps in and does exactly what God asked him to do. That long trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The idea of she's going to have a baby. Neither one of them having a clue what that means or what to do about it. I'm sure Joseph just ran for water. I mean, you know, giving birth is a big deal, right? And now, you know, you can suit up as the dad and you can go in there and, you know, stand there like a catcher waiting for it to fly out, you know. And you're, you're watching all that happen. And, and man, that's scary. And, and I know the mom needs medicine, but, you know, some of those dads need as much to be able to be in there and do that. It's, it's a scary time. It's an unusual time. But I, but I think, you know, when I did that, I knew what was going to happen. It had all been explained to me. Joseph didn't have a clue. I mean, he'd seen animal births. He knew people were birthed. But he never was the handmaiden. God did all that through him. Now, the thing about names, biblical names, and especially names related to the Messiah, is that it, biblically what they tried to do is create a name for whoever it was that wasn't just a handle for you to have for other people to know who you were. It meant, it was, it meant to give the essence of who you are. The complete essence of, of all that you are. And so, uh, with, with all of that, Jesus is given the name Emmanuel. All right, here's a great story, which leads to he is Lord. Um, you remember the blind man? The blind beggar? The blind beggar sat there for years and years and years, and, and uh, Jesus and his disciples are walking into town, and and they had this theology that if there was something wrong with you, if you were born and, and you had some sort of uh, slowness, if you were special needs, or if there was something physically wrong with you, it meant that you either sinned in the womb, you turned too many times, kicked your mother too many times, and so God judged you, or your parents sinned, and that's why yeah, you came out some sort of damage. And, and uh, when, when Jesus is walking along, his disciples stopped, and they ask about that. They said, now who sinned? Do you, do you think it was this man, or was it his parents? It's interesting, Jesus tells them, neither. Neither. You know what he's saying? This man is a man of worth. He has a handicap. But he's special. And, and he says, he is like he is so that he can show the glory of God. Isn't that a, just think about that for a minute. When, when God gives parents sometimes a special child, uh, 
you know, God is saying that child is like he is so that he might glorify God. I was thinking about that, just kind of how cool that was that Jesus said that and, and how that meant that. And I started thinking about Rusty. You know, Kay and Richard are asking us to pray for Rusty because Rusty's now kind of going through a little dementia. Some things are happening with him. He's getting a little confused. And, and Rusty's been special needs his whole life. Rusty has also been a special person his whole life. Those of you that know Rusty know that somebody in this world loved you, <laughs> right? Anybody love you any better than Rusty? No. Couldn't wait, to, couldn't wait to be here in church. Couldn't wait to see you. Couldn't wait to go down to Home Depot and be with those people. Couldn't wait to be with all the customers. And all Rusty knew was just love on people. That's all he knew. And he was like a a little glory of God just kind of running around, just sort of a piece of God that everybody gets, gets to experience. And so that's what Jesus is saying. He said, nobody sinned. The man's blind. And he, he's blind so that he might glorify God. And Jesus does what is a, 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 a messianic miracle on him. He, he grabs a little mud and he spits on it and puts it on the guy's eyes. And the guy gets sight, tells him to go wash in the, in the pool. The man goes and washes his eyes, and when he looks up, he can see everything. And it, people have said, probably it came back slowly, and people were fuzzy. No. God healed him right there. And when God healed him, he saw people. He saw, he saw the water. He saw himself. He saw everybody. He saw everything. He saw the trees, the sky. And he began to celebrate he began to just kind of dance around and say, I can see, I can see. And then, of course, the disciples are watching, the Pharisees are watching. And so the Pharisees pull him in, and, and they begin to question him because they don't understand this. Or they do understand it, and they don't want it to be happening. And so they bring him in, and they question him, and they say, what do you know about this guy? Who was it that, that healed you? He said, well, Jesus. I, you know, he's a rabbi, a teacher. I don't know. He just he healed me. And so, so they, they're fighting with him about, you know, his parents' sin or his sin. And, and finally, they let him go. And, uh, and, and then they invite his parents in. You've got to love them. And, uh, and they're afraid of the Pharisee. And, and the Pharisees are even saying, well, this isn't, the really, this isn't the blind guy. This is the guy that looked like the blind guy. And, of course, he's going, no, I'm the blind guy, and he healed me. And so they bring the parents in, and they begin to quiz the parents. And they're afraid they're going to be put out of the synagogue. And they said, hey, he's of age. Ask him. So they bring him back in, and they ask him. And when they ask him, he gives a funny answer. He said, oh, wow. He said, I told you once. You want me to tell you again? Perhaps you want to follow him. Perhaps you want to be one of his disciples. That's when they kick him out of the synagogue. It was kind of like, you know what, I can see. I was blind, and now I can see. You guys never did a thing for me, and this one came by, and he healed me, and you can't even rejoice with me. All you can do is ask me questions about it. They were so lost in their tradition, so lost in their positioning, that they couldn't see this was a great miracle of God. And so the, the, the blind man is, is no longer begging. And you know what the big problem was with the Pharisee? They kept saying, he did that today? Yeah. Well, today's the Sabbath. He must be a sinner. Today's not a day that you do anything. So if he healed you, he healed you on the Sabbath. Can you imagine being a blind guy? And, and they made a deal out of that. He's got to be thinking, you guys are whacked. You guys, you got serious trouble if you're thinking that way. So the blind man... Uh, you know, he, he, doesn't even, he doesn't even really understand who Jesus is. He says, I don't, he's a teacher, he's a prophet, I, I don't know. And so look at John 9, 35 through 40. This is following that event. It says, and, and, and they've thrown him out. So when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, who is he, sir? Now, he's no longer calling him a rabbi. He's no longer calling him a teacher or a prophet. Now he calls him sir, and that, that really could be translated Lord, but small l. 
Who is he? And, uh, and, and he, he says, uh, I, uh, I want to believe in him. And then Jesus looked at him and he said, you have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Now look at his response. Yes, Lord. There it is. The name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. No longer just prophet. No longer rabbi. No longer sir. But now Lord. The Lord of my life. He says, yes. Yes, Lord. I believe, the man said. And he worshipped Jesus. And then Jesus told him, uh, I entered this world to... To, to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Now, yeah. uh, you know, if you don't find humor in the Bible, there's something wrong with you, mm-hmm. right? Jesus has, has uh, looked at this guy and, and allowed the guy to call him Lord. Call him, call him Lord God. Allowed him to worship all in front of the Pharisees. <laughs> and then he says, yeah, I've come into the world to give sight to the blind and, 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 to, uh, and, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some of the Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, are you saying we're blind? That even doesn't... It, it, Jesus never answers that because that thing doesn't even deserve an answer. Of course that's what I'm saying. You are blind. You're completely spiritually blind. Now, when you think about the names of Jesus, there are so many. Uh, Almighty, Alpha and Omega, the Advocate, the Authority, the Bread of Life, the Beloved Son, the Bridegroom, Chief Cornerstone, Deliver, deliver, Faith and Truth, Good Shepherd, Great High Priest, the Son of Man, the Son of God, King of Kings, the Lamb of God, Mediator, Messiah, the Most High, the Supreme Creator over all, uh, uh, the Resurrected Lord, the Door, the Way, the Truth, the Life, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's, there's probably somewhere between 47 and 53 different names of Jesus represented in scripture we're on the name lord we're going to study some of these other names the ones you see in the red are some names that for for the next few weeks we're going to do a series and explain each one of these names and what it meant and why that name was given to jesus now the uh, the name lord was was uh, used very little in the book of mark the gospel of mark the gospel of mark is the first gospel written and so you don't see the name of Lord very often. And then in Matthew, you see it a, a few times more. When you get to Luke, you'll see it about 17 times. When you get to John, you'll see it more than that. But when you get to Paul, you'll begin to see it over 200 times. It was kind of just one of those things, curios, and it just got a little energy, and it began to move. The blind man said it in John. And people began to recognize, yes, he is Lord. Matter of fact, after the resurrection, it became a very popular thing to call the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I want you to understand is, uh, is that the name, uh, the, the name was adopted by the Christians. It was, it was adapted because the name Lord was being used in the Greek world, had been used for, for centuries prior to Jesus coming. And what was happening was, the Roman Empire needed some way to unify their bond. They had, they had so many territories that they, that they were over, and so much, so much of that was, was different cultures, and they needed a unifying term. They needed some way to pull them all together. Now, they had the goddess Roma, but not everybody picked up on that. And they, they wanted to get it unified. And so somebody came up with the idea of lordship for the Caesars. And initially, the Caesars were uncomfortable with that, but then as, as decades would go by, each Caesar would become more and more comfortable with that until that was it. That was the unifying force. That was it. The Caesar was going to be Lord, and Lord meant full and complete authority over everything. 
And so the Caesar, once a year, you would have to come to the Caesar and you'd have to burn a little bit of incense and call the Caesar Lord. Then after that, you could go worship any God you wanted to worship. But it is the name Lord that Christians would gather themselves around. See, Rome thought it would unify them. It never completely did. It unified the Christian with one another. And they began to make Lord their battle cry. And they would not call Caesar Lord. As a matter of fact, when they didn't call him Lord, uh, they, would be, they would be crucified either at the cross or by flame or in the arena or on the rack. Because they refused to bow down and say, Kyrios, to Caesar. That belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it became a real problem. It became a big problem with, with, uh, with Rome. So, now, let me take you to Philippians chapter 2. And it gives you the importance of the name Lord. And if you're looking for one place to look to really understand what Lord means, this is it. Matter of fact, this is one of the, one of the high points, really, uh, of all of Scripture related to this name would be right here. Because it, it explains theologically what it means to be Lord. It says, though he was God, part of the Trinity, he did not think it of, uh, of equality with God as something to cling to. So Jesus is, is, is going to, he's going to give up his place in the Trinity to be born as a helpless baby. He's going to live a sinless life. And he's going to do that. And, and he's given up, he's given up, not, not given up his godly attributes. He is voluntarily surrendering them voluntarily surrendering the use of his divine attributes. That's really important. A lot of people say when you begin to talk about Jesus, the God-man, certainly he became man, but he was continually God. He was, never, he was never apart from being God. What he was, what he had moved away from and what he didn't cling to was the voluntary use of his divine attributes. He looked just like any other Jew. You know, I know artists show him walking around with a little glow. He had no glow. There was no aura. Nothing really physically special about the man. He looked like any other human being by design because he didn't cling to those attributes. Then it goes on. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he when he when he appeared in human form now that is that is Jesus coming to live so that he can sacrifice for us and he remains the god man so many people have struggled with this uh, when, when Jesus is on the cross and, and, and he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We've tried to explain that uh, uh, in, a, in a dozen different ways. And we say that, well, that was his humanity coming out. And, uh, and no, it wasn't. It was the fact that, that he was being separated from God for a period of time, which had never happened from all of eternity. And for just, for just a short period of time, for three hours, while God could judge sin completely and take the sacrifice, the only sacrifice for our sin, God had to look away. And for the first time in all of eternity, Jesus does not feel the Father. And when he doesn't feel him, he cries out. And in Jewish terms, you know, it's, this is the only scripture in all of, of the New Testament that is preserved in Hebrew. Isn't that interesting? That, that voice from the cross when he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You think that the Holy Spirit preserved that in Hebrew for a reason? I think so. I mean, you have to say, that might be the case. And when you read Hebrew, if you want to put emphasis on something, they, they say it twice. And so he's not saying, why hast thou forsaken me? That's not the subject of the sentence. The subject of the sentence is, I no longer feel you because I am, 
I am the sacrificial lamb for sin, and I know you have to look away from me, but I know I still belong. 127 times Jesus would say, my Father who is in heaven. 37 times he'd say, your Father who is in heaven. One time. One time. He would say, my God, my God. What does that tell you about eternal security? There are times in our lives after accepting Jesus as our personal Savior, if you're Josh Hamilton or you're you, you look at your behavior and you think, how can I even know Christ and have that kind of behavior? You can. You can by grace. Has God ever felt like that? Yes, he has. On the cross. And he knows that you can, you can begin to, to shame yourself rather than look at your sin and say, I'm better than that, and turn and walk back, from, back with him. This is why eternal security is such a big deal. You must know that the grace of God has saved you and sealed you until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than any sin you can commit. And when you have accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, he comes in and he seals your life until the day of redemption. And what the Holy Spirit has done, you can't change. There's an epidemic in churches in America, especially in Baptist churches, where people have believed, I've lost my salvation. That's heresy. That's wrong teaching. If you have salvation, if you've given all that you know about you to all that you know about God, and you have called him Lord, and he has come into your life, and he has saved you, I don't care what your behavior looks like at any particular time, you can't change the fact that you are saved. Now, you ought to act saved, but you can't change it. There's not, any, there's not anything you've done that has changed it, because what God did is what God does. And when he does it, it's done. So, Paul goes on. He said he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor, and he gave him the name that is above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. In heaven on earth, under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, Lord Kyrios. And he caught them all. He didn't, left, he didn't leave anybody off. Everybody. Everybody in heaven, everybody on earth, everybody below the earth will call him Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know what that means? That means that one day, everybody that has ever lived, everybody that has ever been, been, a, been a part of, of earth, human life, and everybody that is in heaven, every angel, and every demon, everybody will call him Lord. Some of them will call him Lord to their shame as they're headed for eternal hell. Others will call him Lord with all glory in their heart because they know they're heaven bound. But we will all call him Lord. Now, preachers love to turn a phrase, right? They love to make stuff up, make it sound good and theological. I'm, one of the phrases I remember hearing years ago, the guy said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I know he's preaching about lordship. He's preaching about behaving yourself. and He's preaching about acting like a good Christian. But can I tell you what? He's Lord whether you behave or not. He's Lord whether he's Lord of all of your life or not. He's Lord, period. It's got nothing to do what you can add. You bring zero to the table. It is his glory. It is, it is he who is Lord. So We've got to straighten that out in our head. <laughs> so he, uh, he lived his whole life under the Father's authority. That's what Paul is explaining to us. He lived under the Father's authority, did exactly what he was sent here to do, without a glitch, without a mistake, without a sin. And he died, came as a slave, came to do something, did it, exactly the way God had directed him. Now, when we call him Lord, let me just give you kind of an A, B, C, D, let me, what, what you're saying when you call Jesus Lord, because, you know, there's some people who, you know, something will happen and they'll go, oh, Lord. 
They don't know what they're saying. We must realize what we are saying when we call him Lord. First of all, you're saying we affirm our allegiance. When you call Jesus Lord, you're saying, I'm in. I'm on your team. You got me. I'm affirming my allegiance to you. My allegiance goes nowhere else. I'm not thinking about some other God. I'm not thinking about some other system that I can get into. I am in allegiance with you, God. You're all I got, which is a great thing to recognize. Because no matter where else you go, Jesus is all you have. And he is Lord. He also, the second thing is we bow to Christ's authority. The word Lord absolutely means authority. And so what that means is it means the answer is yes, God, whatever you're commanding me to do is what I should do. I am under your authority. I am like a soldier who just shows up for duty. And whatever you tell me to do, that's what I need to go do. We bow down and we begin to understand God has a will for our life and it's a perfect will and we follow inside that will and we begin to move with God as to what he's saying because we know he's Lord. Because he's in charge. And whatever God says, that's what I'm willing to do. I'd give houses and lands, change my dreams, change my plans. Because I'm giving it all up to you. Second thing, we commit to him all that we are and all that we have and all that you ever hope to be. Every once in a while, you should just get up and look around at all your stuff and go, it all belongs to God. God wants to take some of it away, blow some of it up, burn it, let it go. Say goodbye. Have you ever thought about that? It's one of the things you're doing. You know, it, it was a little thing, but I bought an old BMW one time and um, got a real good deal on it. And, and it looked wonderful when you walked up on this side. And you walked up on the other side, it didn't look so good. But I never walked up on that side, so it didn't matter. And I loved that little car. And I, I remember I pulled in the, in the garage one day, and I'm talking to the, on the phone, which I'm always doing. And... Uh, and, and I turned it off, and I noticed that the lights were all on, like the fog lights and this light and that light, they're all on. And then and I, I kind of looked at it, and I thought, this is odd. And I'm talking to my buddy on the phone. And I said, there's smoke coming out of my uh, air conditioner. And that's not right. And I just got in a big gulp, and, and so I grabbed the big gulp, and I threw it into the air conditioner. And, and about when I was doing that, my buddy's saying, don't put any water on it, it's probably electrical. And, uh, and I said, can you, can you hold for a minute? I think I better pull it out of the garage. And I did, and the car completely burned up. Sitting there in the driveway. You know, it's kind of one of those times when I thought, well, God, thanks for that car. Guess I don't get it anymore. And, you know, you know, your car burns up, you know, the tires melt. I mean, there ain't nothing left. <laughs> uh, it's fun for the neighborhood. I'm out there with a garden hose. Well, God didn't want me to have this car anymore. And, you know, I think back at that. That car probably had a lot of little things wrong with it. It was probably going to sometime, some way hurt me somehow. So God just decided to fry it and, and use my stupidity to move that along. So the idea is that just you commit to him all that you are and all that you hope to be and everything you have. Just commit it to God. That's a fun thing to do just every once in a while. Just lay back and just in your heart, just say, God, you're all, I'm all in. I'm, giving, I'm committing again to you everything that I am, all that I have. It, it, it all belongs to you. Then the fine thing, the last thing, is D, we dethrone our own will in our own way. Gosh. You know it's a good prayer? Really good prayer. God, get me out of the way. Get me out of the way. Take you and put you in front of me and get me out of the way. If you just would get out of the way. Sometimes you have a hard time getting out of the way. 
You ever feel that? I was in a basketball game with a bunch of high school kids, and, and we were at camp, and this one kid would come flying down the Come, come flying down the court, and of course I would set up, and he came flying down. He ran into me, and he got a charge, and uh, and and so the next time he, I, I got myself set up, because I was never running back and forth. I figured a long time ago, I'll go halfway, and then we'll make a shot or whatever, and I'll be back here ready to go again. I'm not running the whole court. I'm not stupid, and uh, so I'd get back to my spot. He ran into me again. And he said something, but I couldn't understand it. The third time he ran into me, he just jumped up and he said, can you just get out of my way? And I looked at him, I said, you know, if I could, I would. I'm not enjoying this any more than you are, but I can't move. You're going to have to learn how to move around me. I would hate for God to be moving around me. I would hate to say to God, I can't move. So you're going to have to move around me. No, God, get me out of the way. Whatever that means. Move me over here. Take me over there. Let me line up completely with what it is that you have. And that's where I want to be. I want to be where you want me to be. I want to dethrone me and put you at the very throne. I want Lord to take over and do whatever it is you want to do. With me, around me, through me. He is Lord. He's Lord of all. Whether you recognize that or not. And I pray that the next few days you will say the name Lord in a different way, in a different way of understanding it. And let God minister to your heart what that really and truly means. Lord, we come to you. We come to you giving all honor and all praise and all glory because that's what you deserve because you are Lord and we're not. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came and you gave in a humble way. You led a cross-like life and you died for our sins because you're Lord. And Father, I just pray that uh, in these next few moments and in our week to come, I pray that we would ponder on the fact that Jesus is Lord and that we would move ourselves out of the way and dethrone you again as Lord of all. Father, I pray that we would cry out with great joy and worship so many times before that time when you come so that when that entire crowd gathers together to call you Lord, it's not something that we do for the first time, but it's something that we've done our entire lives and we get the joy of doing it then. And we look forward to that. Father, help us. Help us to be all that you've called us to be in Jesus' name. Amen.